Thomas, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And, yeah, it sounds crystal clear. We're live at uh, blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. And this interview is going to be posted at libertarianprogressive.com and also on our YouTube channel. You can check it all out at libertarianprogressive.com where we interview independent and third-party candidates who are going to be on the ballot and specifically candidates who are the only third option, you know, compared to the Republican and Democrat in their districts. And we're going to have 50-plus interviews this season of uh, candidates that are not Republicans and Democrats on the ballot, like I just mentioned. So today we're talking with Rob Laffam, L-A-P-H-A-M, Libertarian, running for the U.S. House of Representatives in District Number 2 in the Sunshine State of Florida this 2016 election year. Forget about Hillary and Trump. This is where... uh, the action is is in the House of Representatives, the Congress. And so, how are you doing today, Rob? Thomas, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, by the way, where are you uh, calling? Where, where am I calling to, or where are you physically? Not that that makes a whole lot of difference these days, but where are yeah. you? No, well, I do want to. I'm in Florida, actually. I'm a little bit under the oh. Tampa area, but we call people all across the country. I've interviewed people in Colorado and Texas and Minnesota, etc. Sure. So. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad this to is uh, a... have a chance to chat with you. Yep. Yeah, it's good to talk to you, too. And um, so now we're looking at your website, which is a good place to start here, and that is rob for for congressorg and, um, and I always like to look at, at the issues. And on there, you list, um, I think, 15 pledges. And so, you know... Uh, this interview could go a lot of ways, but how about the way of substance? And uh, let's just get to it. Uh, I mean, um, so you have quite a platform there that I suppose differentiates you or gives your um, constituents, potential constituents, um, fellow citizens, a reason to vote for you. And do you want to go over that platform a little bit for us and just tell us, uh, sure. you know, I'm, about your candidacy? Yes, sir. I'd be glad to. Um, I think that the most important issue. Uh, The issue that touches every other issue is the size and power of the federal government. And, uh, you know, if the government's large, it can take away all the freedoms that we have while negatively affecting every issue we care about. If it gets smaller, I think freedom wins. I uh, have a tag on the bottom of uh, every email I send out. And it says the Libertarian Party is the only uh, party in America that... um, (coughs) Excuse me, <clears throat> got my throat, throat going. Is the only only party in uh, America that uh, uh, holds. Uh, uh, shoot, I, I'm uh, losing my own train of thought here, Thomas, and I have to apologize. You probably ought to have an right. email tag hey. on there all the time. Uh, 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 only party in America that uh, is is committed to reduce the size of the federal government and to protect all the rights of all the people all the time. Now, that's a mouthful, and we're talking about economic freedom on the one hand and political freedom on the other, and that's, uh, that's a basic uh, tenet. But as far as those pledges, the 15 that I've made, I think uh, the most important one is the first one. And I say that if I am elected, I will never vote to expand government authority or to increase government spending from today's high levels if, uh, if new funding were to be needed for some essential function of government, I will vote to reduce government overspending elsewhere rather than raise taxes or add to the nation's debt. So that is one uh, distinguishing characteristic of my campaign that neither the Democrat nor the Republican will touch with a barge pole. They will not make that statement. And I have uh, made that pledge in front of both of them at miscellaneous uh, dog and pony shows across the district and they choose not to respond to it (laughs) because they really can't or if they did and made a pledge to that effect and then if they were elected you know darn well that that videotape or recording of what they said would be uh very difficult for them should they run for re-election so that's a key so you pledge uh, to be a good steward of people's uh of the taxpayers money right is what you're saying sure I, I, I do. And I think it's important to uh, make a statement, um, which is this. 
no matter who you or any of the listeners voted for in their entire lives for Congress, I'm just talking Congress here, no matter who they voted for, they were let down. Uh, didn't matter whether they voted Republican or Democrat. It, it, it didn't work for them. Um, I'm very fond of saying that uh, Calvin Coolidge was the last president to balance the budget when he turned over uh, reins of government to uh, Herbert Hoover in 1929. From then, right up through the present, all 14 presidents, every single one of them spent more money than they took in. There's no exceptions. And even presidents for whom I have a fair amount of respect, such as Ronald Reagan, uh, he still grew the budget. Everybody does it. And so that's at the presidential level. But then you get to the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8. It's the Congress that votes the money. The president cannot spend a dime unless it's authorized by Congress. And whether the Congress was, whether the House of Representatives was controlled by the Democrats, as was the case for the most of the years in, since 1929, but not all, or whether the Congress was controlled by the Republicans, didn't make any difference. When the president needed money, he got it. And, um, the, and there are some exceptions within the administration. So I think Harry Truman had two years where he had budget surpluses. Dwight Eisenhower had three. Uh, Bill Clinton claimed to have had one. There's a dispute, but, but there's no dispute that from the beginning of their administration to the end of their administration, every president spent more than they took in. So whoever you voted for belonged to a party that voted to increase the debt. They may also have voted to increase your taxes. That's going on all the time at, at, at the same time. So I'm, uh, that's a, a fundamental uh, disappointment that I have with the Republicans and the Democrats who have run for office over the years. They don't have budget responsibility. We wouldn't run our households like that if uh, the federal government were held to the same standards as, as we are as individuals, they'd be bankrupt. And many say, and I guess I'm one of them, <laughs> that the federal government is, is also bankrupt in a sense. Yeah, I mean, it sounds really like what the Republicans and the Democrats are, are doing is that they're running to see who gets to spend your credit card. <laughs> I mean, so um, like, oh, sure. please pick me so I can run, run up your credit card and leave you with the bill. Um, so now you did have a lot of issues here. Um, I mean, and, and you're saying just the opposite of that. I mean, uh, yeah, let's do you mind if we go to, through the list, actually? I mean, it's a pretty good uh, list. No, I don't and, have it in front of me. If you, uh, if you, I, no, can I pull it up here. if I need to. Or, yeah. Oh, okay, I'm just going to fire questions or ask for explanations and I'll get Yeah, them. absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to go down the list and then I do have a set of questions for you. Um, so here's here's your list of uh, promises, pledges, um, downsize the U.S. military, uh, shut down the NSA, TSA and, and mass surveillance and drug prohibition, eliminate the federal income tax, localize education, fully restore the right of self-defense replace privileged government pensions with social security opt out of social security um, end crony capitalism expand health freedom to make it affordable safe and effective demand government financial transparency nullify and void bureaucratic regulations impose term limits and replace government meddling in money um, and so that, and you can find out more if you're listening, Rob, F O R for congress.org. And um, so, uh, so yeah, that's a, a good list there. And, um, you know, some websites only have like one or two things, <laughs> but uh, not on your website. And, and that's good. I think that's uh, a good Thomas, uh, it's, it uh, is a challenge. Yeah. The, the reason it, it is a challenge, I mean, uh, I think the, the rule books say when you are. Uh, talking about uh, uh, complex issues often, uh, uh, the, the rule of thumb is you hold yourself to two or three issues. On the other hand, on a website, you read as much as you want, and if you like what you see, you may continue reading. So I don't mean to suggest that I have the ability in uh, when I'm addressing a group to cover all those things, but I'm glad you went through the, the, the short list, and we can discuss why any one of them seems to make sense. But uh, yeah, uh, frankly, absolutely. You, you, what, and, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. oh I'm. I was just going to say some of them can kind of be symbiotic with other ones, you, you know, or in a holistic way as well. And um, but yeah, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Please continue your thought as well. 
Oh, I was just going to make the point that it's, uh, frankly, uh, refreshing. I've never had the situation where an interviewer read all the 15 pledges, uh, sorry, summarized uh, the the summary of them. And uh, so, you know, we can go in any direction. I think the the, one of the issues, uh, one of the pledges that I've made that has caused more eyebrows to be raised in my congressional district has to do with downsizing of the military. And, and, and I'll address that. But just let me throw in that the, uh, that Congressional District 2 is the largest uh, landmass, the largest uh, congressional district in Florida, covers uh, uh, all of 14 counties and parts of five others throughout the central and eastern Florida panhandle and what we call the Big Bend area. And then it goes all the way down to Ocala in central Florida in the southeast part of the district. It's a pretty broad area. And the, there's large swaths of land that are... Um, the folks that live there are very often few and far between uh, old-time Democrats, and in recent decades, they've moved pretty conservative as far as their values are concerned. And so the district is more conservative since some redistricting was mandated by the Supreme Court last December. Anyway, that's the, that's the district. As far as downsizing the military, what causes folks to kind of gasp, in my experience, is, uh, and I throw it out because... I want to generate discussion. And I say we ought to downsize the military 60%. And folks say, well, you can't do that. That's ridiculous. Well, I'm not an emperor. I'm running for, uh, for a seat in one of 435 seats in Congress. And it is worth discussing that type of issue. Um, reducing our uh, military by 60% uh, is, a, is a phenomenal change from the direction in which we're going. But if we did it, we still would be spending three times more than the Russians spend as one example of how to quantify it. Or you could look at it from a, another perspective. We have 22 aircraft carriers today, of which uh, half of them are the, the super carriers that we are familiar with that we see on television, whatever. The others are somewhat older. And Russia has one carrier, and China has one carrier. And the only country in the world that has two carriers are the British and they're the little ones, which are why they you know, develop the Harrier jump jet, because the runways are not long enough for conventional jets. We, have, we, are, so, uh, we, we are able to so overpower any other country or collection of countries uh, with conventional power. I'm leaving nuclear aside for the moment. That The question is, why are we spending $600 billion a year? And so I, I like getting into that discussion when, when folks raise it, because... Uh, there is a ex Navy pilot that says, "Oh well, we only have I've, I've honestly forgotten the numbers." And he was using actually Navy ships. At one point, he says we had 550 ships, and now we only have 220 or something like that. And I said to, uh, I, I guess I now regard him as a friend because we've got to know one another. I said, "Look, the number of tanks or planes or ships is totally irrelevant. You want to look at throw power." My dad was a fighter pilot in World War II. He flew the P-47 Thunderbolt, which was a, obviously a prop plane with uh, eight 50 caliber machine guns mounted for each side uh, on the wing. And that plane was deadly in terms of the Luftwaffe uh, enemy uh, in World War II. But if you could, and, and the United States government, U.S. Army Air Corps, ordered 15,000, had 15,000 of those planes delivered during the course of the Second World War. By contrast, the number of F-22 Raptors, and I live next to Tyndall Air Force Base, which is, which is uh, home to some of those Raptors, the U.S. government, or excuse me, the U.S. Air Force ordered 189 of them. But if you could take 100 of the P-47 Thunderbolt and bring them up to mint condition and have them take to the air with experienced pilots and had just one or two F-22 Raptors and had a war game, Team A, Team B, the, the Raptors would knock off the 100 Thunderbolts in no time flat. There is no comparison between our military capability today and prior generations of our own capability. So you could take today's military and put them up against military, our own military of a generation ago or even going back to World War II. There's no comparison. So there's a tremendous opportunity to reduce uh, government spending in the uh, military arena. Part of that is I would take the 200,000-plus troops that we have stationed in 140 countries around the world and bring them all home. You don't do that overnight, but you do uh, stop trying to 
uh, project the United States as the world's policeman. And uh, uh, it's, it's a waste of money. So well, I think anyways, even some that's of the one military issue we can go on to any number and I invite you to, to challenge, sure, we, you know, the thought process here. We will. And, and I think I've heard some military generals state that, um, you know, our, our budget is one of our biggest uh, threats that's out there. And so, you, you know, if all that we're going to if our military is going to eat up like a cancer, you, you know, it, our budget and and the generals don't even need all of these uh you know devices that we have and we're still going to have a military three times bigger than Russia then then you might you know have a point like you said it's probably good to debate it i mean it's like it's a sacred it's nothing should be a sacred cow i mean you know talking about yeah. defense and having courage um there's nothing courageous or strong about uh you know being afraid to you know, talk about a topic. And um, so real strength would be, you know, being able to tackle these issues uh, head on and, and strongly. Sure. Um, so, uh, so that, you know, there, there, there's a lot to discuss in, in that as well. I think um, Gary Johnson, uh, who's also running as a libertarian says we should have a, um, uh, an impenetrable uh, defense but I mean, we're friends with most countries in the world. We're part of NATO. We don't really have any big militaries. Um, y- you know, it, I mean, we could really just take out anyone at any time. Uh, so yeah. Uh, now, I do have a list of questions here, Rob, um, and we can come back to the military. But let's kind of just uh, cover the whole scope, and that's the reason why I read off the 15 issues because I don't want someone to get the impression from just one issue because. They shouldn't vote or not vote, well, necessarily, I don't think, or form an opinion just on one issue um, because you're going to have bills from all different things, uh, subjects every single day if if you were in the Congress, um, everything from the environment to small business. And and so it's all symbiotic and and it all matters. Um, So let's talk about, um, I have a list here, and I just want to get your uh, short views on each of them. Um, how about okay. accountability and transparency? What do you say and what, what are some of your thoughts um, in this campaign, campaign season about accountability and transparency? Well, the, the federal government has a long way to go in terms of achieving any reasonable transparency. I like one of the yardsticks on that is anything that we provide as individuals to the IRS, this is before we run them out of business, If we provide it to the government, the government agency should be just as open with their information. And frankly, if they're not willing to be that transparent, uh, if the government agencies are not, then frankly, I would vote to defund them or reduce the funding to those agencies. Yeah, it's kind of, again, like you said about the two other politicians wanting to, uh, you know, they're competing against who gets to spend your credit card. Um, I mean, it's just kind of everything's in reverse. Um, they can audit us, but we can't audit them. And by the way, the, back to the military for a second, there was an article recently I, um, that the military was recently audited the first time, I think, in a in decades, if ever. And, and they found that some of the books were fudged up to the tune of $5 trillion. Um, that was in the news in the last couple of months. Um, so, I know accountability and transparency is something that everyone says, but it is an important issue. How about uh, the justice system overall? What are some of your views regarding the the U.S. justice system? Well, uh, and depending on how you define that, I mean, I, for example, you look at the Justice Department, there are 60 different agencies that make up justice, and we could spend an hour just, just dissecting a particular department, such as justice. The only three agencies that if you ask anybody, uh, you know, what makes up justice, the best most folks are going to come up with is, well, that includes the FBI and that includes uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration and that includes uh, uh, Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, ATF Bureau. And those are about that's everybody stops at that point. They don't most of them don't know what the other 57 agencies are, but they're all they're all spending your money. It is. A, a gargantuan enterprise, uh, the just, U.S. Justice Department, that gets into far too many nooks and crannies, takes away from our freedom, does not subscribe to the 
uh, Jeffersonian maximum, government is best, that which or, uh, government is less that governs least, you know, that, that kind of thought, is totally lost on just, Actually, it's totally lost on the entire U.S. government. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what you were getting at with your justice justice question. No, no, but, no again, not anything. Uh, just trying to get um, what, what you know, what inspires you from from, from these questions. And um, how sure. about um, uh, election reform? Do you think uh, there's any room uh, for election reform, possibly? Well, I, there is. There is no question that uh, we have election fraud. Have always had election fraud. And I don't know that there, there is certainly not, to my mind, a federal government solution to it. It's federal government that is, causes most of our problems. I do feel that an informed and active citizenry is important. And I, I blame all of us as U.S. citizens for not uh, volunteering more of our time, whether it is as an election poll watcher or being involved in some way they don't necessarily have to run for office, but I think uh, it's not a bad idea to try that now and then to get a feel of what the issues are. So I'm recalling the year I was drafted in 1966, and uh, the president at the time, Lyndon Johnson, um, uh, was first elected to the U.S. Senate and, and had his nickname Landslide Lyndon because of uh, 212 uh, votes in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, which came from gravestones, and it was one of those squeaker elections, and he just got in, and there was reference there to, to election fraud. There's election fraud today, along, particularly along the uh, South Texas border, McAllen-Brownsville area, and uh, it's a good old boy network, and I speak from some experience having lived in Texas before I moved to Florida. And uh, so there is fraud everywhere. I'm not sure that there is a, a better answer other than to have uh, citizens far more involved and not just assume that the authorities are somehow going to take care of it because they won't. That's very well said. And uh, how about um, your thoughts about small and mid-sized businesses? Well, um, of course, most, most businesses in the U.S. are small and mid-sized, uh, and they have a tougher challenge than any, any size business. Because uh, and the biggest challenge they face may not necessarily be overtaxation, even though they are overtaxed. And I do not subscribe to corporate tax at all, to be honest with you. But leaving that particular issue aside, the thing that kills small business is regulation. I do not think there is a single small or medium sized business person listening to this broadcast that has not broken some regulation or other in the last year. They just have. There are too many of them. It is impossible to stay on top of all of them. And um, it is a, it's a growth killer. It's a job killer. If you are one of the thousands of businesses who today has 49 or 50 employees, you're probably not increasing your, your, your staff, even though you would like to uh, produce more goods or more services to, to uh, gain more market share. That's every business wants to do that. But why would you go over the 50 employee threshold and have the morass of Obamacare down on you and the requirement to provide uh, the insurance that's required to be provided? You just don't want that, so you don't do it. And that's just one example. I uh, was looking at a survey just yesterday where uh, there was what, there was some fairness, uh, pay fairness, and 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 family leave, and uh, I've forgotten the name of the particular act. But it takes place when you have more than 15, not 50, employees. And this one's not law yet. But there is a never-ending uh, list of laws and regulations that make it very difficult to start a business anymore. Businesses that are successful today, many of them wouldn't have started in the first place if you had the regulations we had to, or sorry, the regulations that need to be put yeah. up with. So it's a job killer. Yeah, that's a good point. And actually, if you look at the statistics on new businesses that have been opening over the last couple of decades, I mean, it's just, you know, it's like a hill going down. And um, that's unfortunate. And hopefully we can turn that around. Um, so what about um, since you're running for the U U.S. Congress, um, I'm sure you'll have some uh legislation and some votes that you would have to cast regarding foreign policy. You might even meet with foreign diplomats and so on. And so what are some of your thoughts uh, in 
you know, your approach to foreign policy? Well, I imagine if I were elected to Congress, the State Department would be, I'd be last on their list to be meeting with foreign diplomats. Not that we couldn't have an engaging and, and effective discussion, but uh, number one, foreign aid, I ask, why should we be distributing foreign aid? I mean, I, w- I, I would phase it out. There's too much of it ends up uh, corruption and leaders end up with uh, money they shouldn't have. I'm recalling just a couple of months ago, the Panamanian organization that uh, on a WikiLeaks type of uh, information that got out uh, people, including the uh, prime minister of Iceland, was on the list. And these were these uh, secret accounts that we used to call Swiss bank accounts or Cayman Islands. And there are more sophisticated ways of doing it. So foreign aid, there's a lot of corruption involved in it. I think uh, I don't think it's a massive amount of money, something like 15 billion dollars in foreign aid. Uh, worldwide uh, every year and but uh, it w- w- and whatever the amount is the equivalent uh, according to I forget I think it was the Heritage Foundation but we could have 330,000 more uh, elementary school teachers every year if we didn't have foreign aid in other words we could be building our own uh, economy and uh, the prospect of a better life for our own kids or alternatively we could have 350,000 more policemen for the same amount that we spend on foreign aid. And Thomas, I'm just talking about regular foreign aid and not the other foreign aid, which is military aid, of which I think Israel is probably the largest recipient. Phenomenal amount of money being wasted. So uh, now I think that there are tremendous opportunities for improving our relationships with many countries in the world by getting the heck out. I do not think, even though... Uh, Germany, for example, I'll just pick some some strong place, relatively strong place in Europe. On the one hand, they're glad that we have such a heavy military presence there because it contributes to their own economic interests. But I really don't think they appreciate the high handedness of the United States. Most recent example coming to mind was when uh, Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Newland a year ago was uh, recorded on telephone call to our ambassador to the Ukraine and uh, about the European Union having a different view of the Russian threat in the Ukraine than the United States. And I will say what she said because it's been reported, even though, well, I guess you're not subject to federal communication regulations. But she said, fuck the EU, quote, unquote. I'm not editorializing here. It's just what she said. And she's recorded. And that is symptomatic of the disdain that many other countries, all of which are less powerful than we are, uh, they hold the United States in such such low esteem. So I think there is a great deal that we can do on the diplomatic front to be an honest player in with the countries of this world and not uh, throw our weight around for no darn good reason. Same thing with the Middle East. I mean, we shouldn't be there. We are there. You mentioned Gary Johnson in another context earlier, and I'm not sure he's been as specific as I would be in that situation. And uh, with respect to ISIS, uh, uh, I I mean, I believe we should clean up what we see. You finish what you start. And so unlike many of my uh, libertarian friends, I would send in the seventh fleet, the 82nd airborne, I would send in whatever is necessary to go in and clean up that mess. And I'm not talking about nation building or building roads or schools or handing out candy bars. You send in the best, you knock it out. And then you tell the Shia and the Sunni guys, you've been fighting for centuries, generations, and you got to stop it. We are, we've cleaned this up. We are not fixing anything that we broke. Um, uh, You've got your oil. Uh, Learn to get along. And if you have a replacement to ISIS surfaces over the next few years, you've got to deal with it because we're not coming back. And frankly, I think that the, uh, that kind of approach has the best prospect of having uh, these, uh, uh, these, these internal conflicts resolve themselves. And then the United States retreats to its own country, and everybody knows that you don't mess with the United States. As Governor Johnson says, if we're attacked, we attack back. And I like that as a general overall philosophy. And also it saves us a bunch of money and allows us to put more uh, financial and other resources into fixing our own challenges at home. Yeah, and and, um, I was just thinking, and I might be wrong on this, but I mean, you know, maybe we, 
need an overall sense of uh, regrouping. I mean, sometimes it's important to, to regroup the military. They've been stretched, uh, you know, have had long missions for a long time. I mean, Afghanistan's like the longest war. Some of these people have been away from their families for a long time. I mean, we should finish what we start. Um, but uh, it might be a good time to just let the military regroup for a while. I mean, I, but that's just my personal thought on that maybe um what tell, about tell uh, us, you know when you i'm sorry you know go ahead go ahead please well, yeah, you know when you so let's talk about uh, uh, uh military servicemen and women and being away from their families there is no reason for us to be in afghanistan today we went in there because somebody said Osama bin laden's there and the taliban is shielding him and so we send in the troops and so forth we didn't find him uh, spent a year going around Tora Bora someplace looking for the guy, and he wasn't there. Um, and then we, then we have this mission creep, nation building, and we are trying to uh, overhaul a country and tell them that American values are the values that they should adopt, and um, uh, here we're going to build a school here and run roads there and so forth, and we get ourselves caught in this quagmire because who are we to be telling some folks from another country, that their way of life is wrong. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I am the first person to stand up for the, the good things that happen in terms of teaching young women or teaching girls, uh, uh, giving them the same education opportunities as, as males have. But frankly, it's not our business. And it has proved over the last 10 years to be a spectacular failure. Every time we declare a war on something, it ends up as a spectacular failure. And since World War II, Maybe the only thing that we managed to handle and could say was a success was the, was the move on Grenada a couple of de- few decades ago, uh, Reagan years, which is a silly little thing. But we don't win anything. Um, and that's not just military, Thomas. Uh, again, my friend LBJ, in 64, he declared a war on poverty, and he was going to eradicate poverty from the United States. What a crock. I mean, he put billions of dollars into that program. And 50 years later, the General Accountability Office in 2014, they uh, analyzed the success or failure of the war in poverty. And they found that the poverty rate in 1964 was 14%. This is what the government has, is reporting. And they found that over the 50 years between 1964 and 2014, that the United States federal government had spent $20 trillion dollars in the war on poverty. They're adding up all the welfare programs that came out of that a declaration, the war on poverty. That is not the same $20 trillion that our national debt is approaching as a coincidence that two numbers are about the same. But they said the U.S. government has spent $20 trillion over 50 years. And then in 2014, the poverty rate was 14.3%. The poverty rate didn't change. It got a little worse. And we spent $20 yeah. trillion dollars to achieve nothing. And if all of us 325 million people living in the United States had their share of that $20 trillion, we each would have had $61,000 more in our bank accounts. Would have been far better off in terms of creating new businesses and uh, improving our economic uh, outlooks. And many of the people who ended up living on welfare programs over many years, some of them would have been more motivated to, to get jobs, seek uh, gainful employment in the workplace and under the various welfare programs at the time they were penalized if you went out and got a job and your income was more than a certain amount then you'd lose the free check from the government every month that's just nonsense sorry i guess i got yeah, off that's, foreign affairs and military no that's amazing facts today I, I never knew that so you're saying that we you know we spent about in the last many decades uh 20 trillion dollars the percentage rate of the poverty remained the same. In, in no. essence, I mean, uh, you could make the argument that the twenty trillion dollars could have just been split up, and it probably would end up being better off um, than the situation that happened. I mean, that's something to really sink that thought in uh, for a moment. Yeah, absolutely. So about another failed war. Um, what about um, you? Think the war on drugs is a success? <laughs> what a disaster that is. You know, I look at drugs, and, and, and by the way, I mean, this is, uh, uh, some folks are, are saying, oh, you know, it's the Democrats, too much government. The Democrats do articulate and, and, and support too much government. Uh, they're honest about it. The Republicans do the same thing, but uh, I guess I'm getting off the topic. So, 
the Drug Enforcement Administration was created in 1971 by Richard Nixon. And uh, that's not a well-known fact. Uh, everybody knows that Nancy Reagan said uh, no, no more. It's just say no. That was the slogan in those years and so forth. Abysmal failure, Thomas. Same as prohibition. Uh, uh, there are so many parallels between the 1920s and, and the government's war on alcohol at that time. It didn't work. Uh, drugs don't work either. If you got rid of the Drug Enforcement Administration tomorrow, and I would be voting to reduce the funding right down to the fact that there's nothing left to support anything in the Drug, Admi uh, Drug Enforcement Administration except their education programs. Uh, I certainly support uh, the, uh, uh, the f egg in the frying pan and, and, and cooking up and your brain is fried and that type of thing. I, I support uh, education, and in, in terms of advertising, that's fine. Nothing else they do has any value. If you could, uh, and we see it today in Colorado, I guess Washington State as well, but if you could buy drugs over the counter at a, a pharmacy um, and uh, didn't have to worry about the cops raiding your house and so forth, the price of uh, many drugs would drop to the cost of a price of aspirin. I mean, competition would kick in. And I don't take drugs. Excuse me, I, 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 I've taken an aspirin or an Aleve and so forth, but I'm not a I, I don't take uh, illicit drugs, uh, never have. But if you want to, hey, have at it. It's your body. If you are so foolish as to take some drugs that have a pretty high probability of causing you harm, that's fine. You have to accept the responsibility uh, in accordance with, uh, uh, with the freedom uh, that I would give you to take drugs. But so many problems would be alleviated alleviated, excuse me. Uh, I'm thinking of the <laughs> drug, which is the aspirin right. substitute. Um, if you didn't have a Drug Enforcement Administration, think of the massive disruption on the cartels south of the border. I mean, what are they going to do if drugs are freely available and uh, so you don't have to buy them of unknown quantity from some idiot on, on a corner at, at greatly inflated prices? And frankly, uh, I mean, it, the DEA is not effective anyway. It's estimated as much as 90 percent of the drugs get through. They have these massive drug busts and millions and millions of dollars and, and warehouses full of whatever it is that they go ahead and burn up. But they're only hitting an estimated 10% of the entire drug trade anyway. So you say DEA, I say get rid of it. It doesn't serve the public interest any more than prohibition served the public interest in the 1920s. Yeah. It oh, and the other thing, would, Thomas, on, on this thing, yeah. I think, at least as far as federal prisons, I believe – it's true to say that 40% of the federal prison population has to do with drug uh, so-called offenses. Most of those folks, it's victimless crimes. You know, they got locked up for, I don't know, smoking too much pot or, or, or that type of thing. And um, uh, the prison overcrowding and the cost of our prisons, uh, we would alleviate so many problems if we didn't have victimless crimes, if we didn't lock people up. And there are places, Copenhagen and I think Zurich, Switzerland, uh, and I'm not sure how widespread it is, someplace in Portugal, where uh, drug addiction is treated as an addiction, as a medical issue rather than a criminal issue. And so some uh, jurisdictions, you know, hand out clean needles and that type of thing. Am I promoting this? Certainly not. Am I saying it's a better approach than the criminal uh, approach of the U.S. government and the DEA? Absolutely. Yeah, I guess you have a choice of good or bad, good, better, best. And, I mean, who wouldn't want to choose, you know, the better or best options? Um, so we just have about five more issues here I'd like to get your opinion on here. And um, uh, sure. it's government contracts, crony capitalism. I'm sorry, but do you want me to, to, to respond? I mean, we, we should yeah, have. I, I, I kind of left that you know, one okay. on a You know, crony capitalism is there, not but... just, uh, I'm sorry, it's not just uh, federal contractors. I mean, like, oh, hey, Department of Agriculture, for example. Every five years we come up with a farm bill, and there's all kinds of uh, opportunities for, for these uh, farmer combines, if you will, to, you know, suck out a million dollars on this project or that project or crop payments, uh, ethanol is a, 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 a crony capitalism, uh, a, a political but not practical approach. The, uh, the Export-Import Bank uh, providing uh, loan guarantees uh, where the commercial market ought to take care of things. If there's, a, if, there's, if there's business to be conducted, 
there's either a good uh, business decision, credit decision to be made. There is no good reason for the U.S. federal government to be taking taxpayer dollars and pouring them into basically making choices between what they consider good businesses, such as Solyndra, and bad businesses. I believe the Congressional Budget Office has estimated that the Export-Import Bank will cost the federal government $2 billion over the next, uh, over the next 10 years. In other words, they waste money on their own private projects. And again, it's only the large businesses that are sophisticated enough with their teams of lawyers and accountants who are able to, to make their way through the morass of federal regulations to take advantage of this uh, government largesse. And uh, it, it needs to stop. I think um, that is an issue that does have consensus on as far as both sides of the aisle, as far as the electric goes. Um, and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that's what is represented in Congress that we have now, though. Um, how about um, trade? What's your stance on trade with other countries? I, I favor all kinds of, of, of free trade, uh, relaxation of, uh, and elimination of, of tariffs to a point. I mean, there is an area where tariffs have a legitimate role. And if, for example... Uh, China is reverse engineering and not respecting our patents in some particular areas. I do see uh, it is in the interest of the American people to protect the entrepreneur, the, the, the entrepreneurial efforts. And, and so I would use uh, 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 importation of, of goods from countries where, where they're not playing fair. But I don't believe it should be a revenue generator. I do believe if foreign countries choose to subsidize their own manufacturing, so that the product arrives in the United States at less cost than it would cost us to make them, hey, let them do it. I mean, they're, they're, they can only do it for so long, and again, they are burdening their own economies with excessive taxation to accomplish that objective. I'm very much in favor of free trade, and I don't want that to be interpreted that, uh, for example, uh, uh, NAFTA or more recently the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I don't know enough of the details to know how much crony capitalism is worked into that. I don't have faith that our national media is necessarily correctly reporting it. I do uh, understand this uh, just this week, uh, announcement out of Michigan, the Ford Motor Company is moving its, the production of all of its small cars to Mexico over the next two years. A lot of jobs can be lost in Michigan in, in, the, in the near future. And, and I, I wonder if, if uh, is it the case uh, that it is strictly uh, 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 less labor cost south of the border, or do we have too many regulations? And uh, it's an issue to be looked at. I, I certainly uh, value the less expensive product, such as presumably small Fords, <laughs> that those of us who need to go buy a car would enjoy. But I, I'm very concerned that the government uh, sticks its nose into things that it doesn't have enough of an understanding about and simply issues regulations, and I just don't see the benefit. I say let the free market work. We have something that we never had before, which is social media. And, and bad actors, as far as uh, large corporations are concerned, who step out of line will reach a point where on Facebook or Twitter feed or whatever these, uh, the, the newer social media uh, vehicles are, they're going to be found out. And we don't need the federal government involved in controlling trade. All right, Rob. And I do want to hear your issue on just, and, and this is another topic that you could probably talk about an hour for, but um, what, what's um, your summary about the environment? Well, I don't know as much as I need to know about the environment. I am very much aware of these uh, situations that pop up where the Environmental Protection Agency declares some stagnant pond of federal uh, area that they need to jump into and, and prevent farmers from doing what they need uh, what they need to do for their own their own farms. Um, I uh, uh, I would like to to believe, and I do fundamentally believe that that private ownership results in better stewardship of 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 uh, of, of environment as far as land is concerned. Um, Owners have vested interests in taking care of their land, if only to preserve its value so that when it is sold at some point in the future or passed down to their children, that that land has maximum value. Uh, now, as far as the uh, other aspects of environment in general, 
I accept the fact that the uh, CO2 emissions these days are, are probably higher than they were decades ago. That is true probably in China, probably in India. We went through it. In the last nine years, the CO2 emissions in the United States, according to the surveys, have actually decreased marginally. Um, is that CO2 emission causing what is euphemistically called these days climate change? I don't like the term climate change. I preferred the global warming that was common 10 years ago, because at least you had a sense from the words of what the, the, the folks who were saying global right. warming, and you could express an opinion whether it was happening or not. We've always had weather change from the time the planet cooled. The Arctic, or actually even the opposite, the, the Antarctic, and also, frankly, in Anchorage, Alaska, core samples show that it was a tropical forest in both of those disparate areas billions of years ago. The last uh, ice age finished, I think, it was 110,000 years ago. Uh, the Sahara Desert used, used to be a tropical uh, uh, um, um, water rainforest and so forth. So weather change has always been with us. I don't think we know enough to be able to say, oh, we men are responsible for the climate changes going on. That's an opinion. We had just a month ago the uh, rain and the floods in the Baton Rouge, Louisiana area. The scientists were saying, oh, it was the, the sea levels are going to rise and the problems are going to be in New Orleans. And, of course, we had Katrina and the dikes uh, uh, um, breaking flooding and so forth at that time. Now scientists who are saying, oh, the sea levels are going to rise, are saying some of the scientists are saying we need to go back to the drawing boards. Uh, and then uh, who's our favorite? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, Elizabeth Warren, Senator Warren was, was saying, and also uh, Jill Stein, the, uh, the Green Party presidential nominee, is saying, oh, uh, 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 climate change is responsible. Well, <laughs> climate change is a catch-all. I do not like the EPA. It's not on my list that I've studied very much. It's not a federal government. It's not an executive-level cabinet department. It is, uh, it's its own administration. Uh, but I feel that uh, the current management of the EPA ought to be retired very quickly. Well, there definitely are some horror stories like there are in every department of government. Like, um, what about, though, being in Florida, like, um, about, uh, you, you know, drilling offshore? Do you think there should be a certain amount that they have to be out? Or does the state have a right to limit certain drilling around it? Or or there that there need to be certain safeguards, or what do you think about that? Well, I'm a big proponent of states' rights, and although uh, I uh, don't see the disasters that are, I mean, there are uh, there are a a lot of uh, environmental uh, and safety regulations in place. You know, the reason we had Deepwater Horizon, what was it, I don't know, six, eight, ten, some years ago now the BP disaster in the Gulf is they're drilling in the deepest parts of the Gulf because they can't drill closer to land because of the legislation that precludes that. If Florida feels it doesn't uh, need a, a revenue economic benefit from drilling off its coast, I guess that is the state's, you know, it's the state should vote on it. I don't think the federal government should have any, any role in it. Uh, the people should do what they want. Uh, they do have to recognize that uh, then, you know, I mean, if tourism should dry up in the future or the sales tax is not enough to for Florida to achieve its objectives and they want to forget about that source of revenue, well, that's just fine. Um, something in the news today that I'm, I'm just trying to remember, a sinkhole and uh, possible uh, uh, corruption of some kind of, of a basic aquifer or water source, and I forget where in the state it was, but just as I was leaving the house this morning, there was a newspaper clip. Hey, I'm, you know... Uh, Certainly across uh, North Florida and probably across the entire state, the aquifer is important. And uh, but I, I, I like to see these types of issues addressed at the state level and not have people in Washington D.C. who know nothing uh, 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 become involved. You recall ten years ago when uh, Al Gore's film *An Inconvenient Truth* came out. There are so many. It was sure. widely uh, applauded, and I don't disagree with the CO2 emissions and so forth, but they had the Greenland ice cap melting and all of Florida south of a line between Sarasota and Fort Pierce disappearing underwater in a, in a sort of Google Earth graphic that they showed. They also showed polar bears drowning in the Arctic because the Arctic ice cap had, and I lived in Alaska with my wife at that time in 2006. And uh, nothing of the sort was happening to polar bears, and the polar bear uh, population was increasing. There's so much inf misinformation on environmental issues that uh, I am uh, 
very disappointed in the uh, posture, generally speaking, of our federal government, which says we need more government solutions, we need more socialist solutions in order to solve whatever the problem is, and they don't solve the problems. Sure, and uh, some of that probably um, has to do with uh, crony capitalism as, as well. If, if there wasn't so many like um, advantages to some of these big multinational corporations, they wouldn't be in the position to you know, be as toxic as they are in the first place, you know? And, um, so that's a good point. And, uh, and yeah, that inconvenient truth, I mean, it's uh, scare tactics. Um, a, a lot of it was, um, and so, you know, Al Gore invented the internet, right? So, um, but, uh, <laughs> right. So yeah. now, um, here's a question. I, I tend to ask everyone this, but I always find it somewhat interesting is um who's some of your favorite past or present people um they can be elected or not uh and, and if you say past um i mean and, and i um i guess my favorite politicians outside the country if i'm allowed to do that is i love Absolutely. a bunch of things yeah. that winston churchill did i uh i love margaret thatcher's uh, my favorite comment of uh, of all is, is thatcher's comment uh, socialism is great except when uh, when you when you run out of other people's money, and I, I just love these sort of zinger one-liners and so forth. Obviously, I'm I'm uh, very uh, attuned to uh, folks that are expressing a libertarian philosophy in, in one form or another. Um, but you know, I, I also admire people who are so selfless. Uh, what was it last week? Uh, Mother Teresa was canonized and was 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 made a saint in uh, you know far less time than has ever been the case before. And you've got to admire people who are not out there. I'm not talking about political leaders because there are precious few political leaders who uh, are motivated by, there may be none that are motivated by selfless intent. Uh, But uh, I admire folks who charity, in many cases, that's the church, although not exclusively, and obviously there's different. uh, Well, anyway, I, I, I admire, and I also actually, I admire people who run for office because um, we can all sit around or we can all put a a protest sign up and go complain about something. And it seems to be a favorite American pastime to complain about something or other. But what I find is that when you decide to try and change something, whether or not you succeed and you get out there and you're talking with the public and picking up ideas that challenge and are different than your own, you, you begin to, you do two things. You educate yourself and you also um, have an opportunity, in my case, I think I'm uh, able to contribute more to the growth of the Libertarian Party in, North, in the Florida panhandle, just because when we sit down and have a discussion, um, we end up uh, exchanging ideas that, they certain, that my, my friends certainly didn't pick up in the national media, which too much of which is corrupt. <laughs> and so... I, I guess that's a general group of people that I admire, people who run for office for the right reasons. Yeah, yeah, and um, I, I, I do too. I think, um, and it's nice to, it's a breath of fresh air to have, you know, at least for in your district, and not every, most districts do have a third choice, but you know what? Not everyone does. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that can only choose between a Republican and, or a Democrat, and um the status quo. And I mean, if you look at the polls, a lot of people are dissatisfied with it, but when it comes to do something about it, I mean, I guess we'll have to see, I mean, in your district, they do have a, another choice here. And I see on your website here, it's, and I do find Congress uh, to be a little less um, congressional politics within the, you know, the, we, the people um, to be a little less divisive to talk about amongst ourselves rather than presidential politics. And, and you have um, your quote on your website here, uh, be libertarian with me for one election, and if after two years we decide we don't like peace, prosperity, and freedom, we can always vote tyranny back into office again. That's a yeah, good that's, quote. Uh, that's, a, that's taking off from, from Gary Johnson's. His, of course, is four years, but uh, we have the same Well, you're embracing there. it so because you put it on your website, so you're embracing that that notion. and. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, why not? I mean, you it's it's 
I, I don't think it can be any worse for sure. And I'm not saying that's something, you know, to run on saying it's not going to be any worse than them, but it, it literally wouldn't. And if anything, you know, looking at your list, I mean, even if you could make an impact on a handful of them, it would be a positive impact. Well, the impact is uh, obviously uh, legislatively internal to Congress is going to be a real tough sell, but it's important to raise the topics and start debating the issues. And I'm not intending to limit any uh, 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 activity to simply legislative activity. It, it's got to be a, there's got to be a public relations component as well. So the, the talking head shows on the various, especially the cable news shows and those kinds of things or the talk radio shows. It's important, uh, and as an elected official, you are paid a little more attention. I think you, you, you garner a little more attention if you have elected office rather than if you are simply a citizen. So I, I think it's all, all part of the, the necessary game to begin to expose folks that just haven't thought about these things to the possibility that we really could have a smaller government uh, that's less intrusive and, by extension, kinder to its own citizens than the... Uh, autocratic mess that we have in Washington today. Yeah, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. It's um it's something that's out there as an option, a choice, uh what, little by little and well Rob, it's been absolute pleasure, uh very inspiring um to see what you're doing here and uh so good luck in your second district there. Thank you so much for taking the time today to talk to us and to go over these issues. We appreciate, uh, y- you know, being in depth. And um, so uh, we'll be posting this interview up in a different couple medias. And, uh, well, any final words here before we end the interview tonight? Well, uh, I, I would, first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, I end some of my uh, uh, talks to, to smaller groups by saying, uh, don't vote for Walter. And for God's sake, don't vote for Dr. Dunn. Vote for Rob. So I guess that's my final remark. All right. All right. Well, take care. Uh, Good to talk to you today. And um, uh, so good luck in your campaign and your election this November 8th. We appreciate your time today. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.